welcome back. You are listening to episode 31 of the How to Life podcast. I'm Dr. Laura Jaggett, the host of this show, and today's topic may be completely outside the box for some when it comes to how you approach the topic of food and its effect on your body and your mindset about it. My guest is David Orozco, the host of the One Small Bite podcast. He is a clinical dietitian who describes himself as an anti-diet food therapist. Anti-diet. How does that sound to you? Intriguing? He and I are going to discuss some different ways to think about food and eating. For instance, have you ever considered food as medicine? Are you familiar with the term intuitive eating? Most people understand that food can be very social, but have you ever acknowledged the emotional component of it? Many have a love-hate relationship with food, but in this talk, we're going to introduce you to compassion-driven eating. Food is your friend. Your body is your friend. And when you get your head on board with this, that's when things change. Enjoy this conversation as David dispels some fear and misconceptions about food. Welcome, David. Thanks for being on the How to Life podcast. Thank you very much, Dr. Jagger. This is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to this, and I really appreciate you having me on. Please introduce yourself and tell everyone about you and what you do. Absolutely. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, but it is my second career. I have a degree in biology originally, but I ended up working for my family's travel agency right out of college. Ten years later, after that, I went back, uh, went to grad school, and I became a registered dietitian nutritionist. That was back in 2006. So I've been at this for uh, about 14 years now. And I have a practice. I also have a podcast called One Small Bite, and that is really the foundation of practically everything that I do professionally as well as personally in my life. And I love podcasting. I love nutrition. I love my practice. And I also dabbled now into uh, writing my first book. So I can call myself an author. <laughs> I'm interested to know why you decided to become a dietitian after being in the travel agency business for so long. How did that come about? Well, I didn't like being a travel agent or running a travel agency. I was sort of thrust into it. But boy, you know, a few years into it, I realized I, this is not what I want to be doing. And uh, little by little, I started reading nutrition books, diet books, uh, supplement books. Uh, I started really dabbling into a lot of supplements myself. And then my mom got sick. She developed cancer, colon cancer. And the way my parents decided to tackle it was what really s stimulated my desire to really understand the science even further. And my father also ended up developing prostate cancer and heart disease. And so things started really, really culminating for me in that realm. And so my perspective has always been, I want to help people avoid the same traps that my parents fell through and that I too was almost dragged into as well. You started this for you. And then yes. as, it, as you started learning about it, you started sharing and helping and caring for your loved ones. And it grew Absolutely. from there. Absolutely. And I love counseling and working with clients. I think you even said it one time too, when people get that light bulb, that aha moment, oh, wow, those epiphanies are you know, gold to me. Now, I like the name of your podcast, One Small Bite. What does that mean? And how did you come up with that? My daughter was learning how to eat around one and a half. And like all kids, they are sometimes intrigued by foods and uh, repulsed by others, right? Both my wife and I are dietitians. And so one of the things we would say to her early on is, sweetie, all you got to do is take one small bite. And uh, fast forward to when I was starting my podcast, my writing coach said, you're always talking about how your clients find greatest success with those small things that really start adding up. And I said, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's like my daughter, we always tell her one small bite. And then, oh, it hit me. And so that's where the name came from. But it also came from seeing the successes in my clients. So many of my clients and the people that I work with 
one of the things that I see that's most common is that they find something and they work on it and they get better at it. And then they find another something and they get good at it and they work on it. And there's consistency and they're committed, but they're not overdoing it. It's nothing big. It's really something small. Like they started drinking a little bit more water or they started dancing a little bit more. And little by little, it's just this positive feed positive kind of thing. And so they started seeing more of that. I would always say to them, you know, whatever one thing that you do that makes you feel good, it'll open your mind to other possibilities, but you've got to start with one. That's the concept and idea. I like that. One small little change. It's so much more manageable than thinking how far you have to go to get where you want to be. Now, you have some interesting philosophies. One of them, and I love this, you call yourself the anti-diet food therapist. Yes. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I don't believe in diets. I love that. Yay. Yeah. Let's, talk, let's talk more about that. <laughs> I don't believe diets should be around. I don't believe any diet is going to be helpful. Now, with that said, do I use diets only for circumstances that medically require that? There is not just one simple approach, and that's why diets are not designed to last. They, they can't. You have to work around them. Diets don't work because they're not sustainable. Now, you also say food is medicine. Yes. A lot of people, you know, I mentioned a little while ago about my parents using supplements. A lot of people use supplements, and they'll tell me, well, David, should I take glucosamine chondroitin, or should I take vitamin D, or should I take this? Or, and I say to them, look, if you go to the doctor, and the doctor sees that there is a true deficiency, then there might be a need for a supplement, but that's usually last resort because you can get practically every single nutrient from the food that you eat or from the things that you do, such as vitamin D, going outside, getting some sunlight. So that's what I mean. I agree with that completely. I adhere to that philosophy as well. We rarely get sick in my family, rarely, rarely. But when somebody is not feeling well, the first thing I do is I just kind of strip their diet. Like I just like, let's no sugar, no dairy. Just let's get down to the basics. Having an awareness of food, having an awareness of, of what your body needs, not just uh, what you need to add to it, but what you need to take away from it is yeah. important. And this leads into another thing that you talk about, intuitive eating. What do you mean by that? Intuitive eating, boy, I wish I came up with it, but uh, it was created by two dietitians like myself. Um, believe it or not, it's about 25 years old. Uh, they first published their book in 1996, or is it 95? Anyway, and um, what it is, is essentially building a positive relationship to food and making peace with your body. It is ultimately an anti-diet approach as well. And the definition of intuitive eating can vary from person to person. And that's one of the things that both Evelyn Trivoli and Elise Resch, the authors of Intuitive Eating, describe. And I've had them on my podcast as well. But intuitive eating is essentially a way of connecting with your body and food. So it's understanding what your body's needs and wants are so that you are eating in line with both your value and what your physiological needs are. By value, I mean, you know, if you want to have a cookie, well, that's okay. You feel nice because you're sharing something that someone made for you and it's a fun treat. And, but do you eat a, a, an entire sleeve of cookies? That's a different story. So now one is not in line with, with what your body needs are. Right. So that's kind of where it goes. Now, that's an interesting topic. In your practice, do you come up against people who have an emotional component to eating? It's not oh my in, gosh. Okay. Yeah. And how, do, how, first of all, how do you help them acknowledge that it's a trigger that's causing you to eat the sleeve of cookie? There's an emotional component to it. How do you discuss that? How do you help them become aware of it? And how do you help them work around that? So, um, I, this is where maybe it sounds a little bit like therapy. And this is why I call myself a food therapist. I will say, so you told me you ate this and it tasted a certain way. How did that make you feel? Mm -hmm. So I use the, how did that make you feel concept? So they start relating to their emotions around food. I'll also tell you that 
I see some people that say that they're emotional eaters, but actually they're not that much of an emotional eater. For example, most people will eat because it's time to eat and there's no emotion stuck to it at all. But I also see that they have a poor relationship with food, but it's not emotional. So with that, there is actually an absence of an emotion. So there's both an absence of emotion and then an extreme of emotions. Understood. And and the emotional state that you're in when you're eating plays a big role uh, in how your body processes the food as well. If you are having a decadent meal, but it's a celebration and you're with friends, it's your body's going to deal with it very well. But if you're eating something out of guilt and self-loathing, your body will not process it. You're right. You're so right. Epigenetics, that's what it is. It's about understanding your environment's relationship to your genes, and then your genes get turned on and off by the stress levels that your environment is producing for you. And your diet is going to be processed in a way, your eating is going to be processed in a way that's uh, um, intertwined with where you are emotionally or your environment. And so if you're constantly in a negative state, that's your environment your body is going to be probably storing a lot more fat or not utilizing it very well, creating more digestive problems, so on and so forth. Yeah. Agreed. I've seen that in my own practice and in my own life. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of how the emotional state works or works against the way your body processes food. Yeah, it's so funny. You know, it's uh, it, very interesting. I often tell people that we are learning our emotions at the same time we're developing our palate. So while you're learning that you're, you're feeling a certain way when there's a certain emotional situation in your life or circumstances, you're also learning, oh, this food makes me feel. Food will always make you feel because that's the essence of food. It's part of your five senses. And so that feeling. Your body only has certain chemical ways of producing certain feelings. So they're very similar to emotions that you feel from a mental standpoint. So they seem very, very similar. So eating creates a lot of the same emotions that either you might be missing in life or you're dying to get more of. Will you give me an example of what is an unhealthy relationship with food? You had mentioned that earlier. Yeah. An unhealthy relationship to food fundamentally is eating against what your body's physiological needs are, as well as what you feel your cultural upbringing is. So then you start creating these narratives in your head that food should be this, or food should be that, or you can't do this, or you can't do that. And then they start covering or blocking out your physiological needs. Mm -hmm. And so that is a poor relationship with food, where your narrative in your head is overriding your body's needs and we're not listening to our bodies. And that's where that negative relationship to food is. When I was growing up and certainly when my parents were growing up, my parents who were uh, children of depression era parents themselves, you eat everything on your plate, whether you're hungry or not. And I made the change in my own life. My kids said, I'm not hungry. Okay, don't eat. If you're not hungry, you don't have to eat. What are your thoughts on that? I was just working with a family whose um, child has a very picky eating relationship. And that's very, very common. In fact, um, any adolescents or children that I see tend to have more picky eating situations than obesity or anything else. And one of the things that I told the parents is ask your child every once in a while, are they full? Before they're done with what's on their plate, ask them to check in on their fullness. The same thing, while they're kind of walking around, pay attention to your emotion, to their emotions. You're their parents. You know their emotions really well. You know, there's that concept of hangry, right? Yes. So this is when you're hungry and that generates more anger. And I say to them, okay, when you see that, ask them, hey, are you hungry? What that does is it really taps into listening, communicating with your body. We call that interceptive awareness. And as children, we are never taught that. And so what we're taught is eat everything on your plate. You've got to eat another bite or clean your plate, or you're not getting out of the table until you're done eating. 
And so what we do inadvertently is we steal someone's ability to pay attention to those nuances. And those are so important. And so the mindlessness eating that I see with a lot of clients can range from something as simple as not being aware of when they're done or eating and only until the plate is clean, even if they're full, to something like, oh, let me get another bite. And that's the mindlessness that I see. I see more mindlessness in people grazing and noshing and snacking and eating out of nerves or because it's there. Or, and it's interesting because even in college, it's like you don't want to do this turn paper or you don't want to do this project and you, you procrastinate. And so you, food is there and that occupies your mind and your time. And, in, and so you have learned that. So we get these messages, both from our parents telling us to clean our plate, and I don't want to do something, and so I don't know how to deal with my emotions when I'm procrastinating, and so then food helps fill that void. And so mindlessness builds that way, little by little. So becoming aware of what you eat is learning how to tune into yourself, learning how to right. notice the cues. That not only applies to food, and, but it also applies to Anything. little nuances like pain in your body. What does yes. this mean? What is it trying to tell me? Tune into it so that you can get the answers which your body is always readily available to give to you. Yes. You had someone on your show, uh, Andrew Takata. Yes. And I loved talking to him because one of the things that he says is, you know, a lot of people don't realize that everything is interconnected. If you get an injury on your toe, that's going to affect your gait. And then your gait is going to then affect the way you start having pains in your hip or your knee or something. And so then sooner rather than later, you start adjusting your walking or your playing or whatever. And now you have an injury in that area because you favored one side, all because of simple little toe pain. What does eating with compassion mean? Oh, I'm so glad that you asked that. That is at the core of almost everything that I see when clients start coming to a place of positivity and change. When people start building self-kindness, when they are mindful, when they understand that there's a shared humanity, meaning that eating isn't just about the food, that it's also about the relationships and connections. When they come to that place of compassion, that's what compassion is to me. It's not, oh, I, I feel for that person. No, I'm talking about compassion for yourself. Empathy, kindness, gratitude, completeness, mindfulness, shared experience, humanity. When we get to that place, we start eating more positively. You know, it, it's something simple like this, for example, like if I eat this I, and I'm already full and I eat more of it, I'm not going to feel great. When I don't feel great, I often then say bad things or I don't act well. And then I overreact to my daughter. Then my daughter doesn't feel good. And then she starts acting like that. You see the, the domino effect going on here. That's what I mean about self-compassion. It's got to start with you. Otherwise, excuse the pun, you're feeding it to someone else. Who are the clients that come to you, David? What type of client do you see and how do they find you? The vast majority of my clients come to me for weight. And most of them are 35 to 70 year olds. And I deal with both men and women, but I also deal with a considerable amount of people with eating disorders. So yes, there's the typical anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, but I generally see a lot also binge eating disorder and then ARFID, which is avoidance restrictive food intake disorders, which is not something that's related to their body image. I also see a lot of people with orthorexia, which is a perfectionistic uh, clean eating mentality, and a lot of millennials and 20-something-year-olds are dealing with orthorexia. It's, um, it's probably just as severe as any of the other eating disorders, but it's very, very misunderstood or not, not aware. Not most people aren't aware of that. But I see a lot more of my 20-something-year-old clients 
that have a lot of diet rules and restrictions and misbeliefs or misinformation about foods uh, and fall into that category quite easily. So it's not just about, okay, here is your BMI and here is your weight and you're going to eat these foods. It's so much more than that. Yeah, because building a relationship takes time. That's as simple as that. Building a relationship with anything or any body is going to take time. You don't cultivate a relationship overnight. You cultivate a relationship over time. So that's why I call myself a food therapist, because what I'm doing is I'm intertwining a therapeutic approach to helping people build a positive relationship to food, which means that we're going to look at the what through the why, meaning we're going to look at what they eat, why they're eating it. Maybe you're out with friends, and so you tend to only eat a salad when you're out with friends because you don't want them to see that you're going to gorge yourself on whatever. Or maybe you eat pizza at a certain time of day every single day, and uh, it reminds you of something that you're going to miss out on. Or maybe it is, I'm going to skip meals because I want to look thin. You know, so... We look at why you are doing what you are doing. We don't eat strictly because of what food we're supposed to eat. We eat because of our why, what's going on in our days, the relationships that we have, what we want to accomplish in life. And I often tell people, you can't trick your body. Are there any tools that you can offer right now to help somebody sort of identify where they are in their relationship with food? something that they can do to start increasing awareness? I'll tell you, it's the same tool that a therapist will use, and that is a food journal. Now, I don't use the food journal like uh, MyFitnessPal or any one of those calorie counting, nutrient counting journals. What I use is good old-fashioned pen and paper. Now, there is an app, there's two apps that I do use for non-judgmental food journaling. One is called uh, 8, A-T-E, and that is a great, it's a great app. It's a photo food journaling app. So people will take a picture of what they're eating and they answer emotional questions, but there's no calorie counting. And what it does is it connects me to that client. And so that's a great tool. But most times I just tell them, tell me what you ate, tell me when you ate it, And tell me what you were thinking or feeling when you were eating it. That's the only three things that I want them to tell me. With that, our sessions really just go from there. So the therapy part is that no change is going to happen overnight. There are going to be some changes that are going to be quick, but you got to work at it. It's not just one and done kind of thing. You have to create new habits and a new mindset and a new awareness and a new understanding. What's, yeah. the, what's the other app you like, David? The other app is called Recovery Record. That I use mainly for uh, my eating disorder clients, uh, but it's very similar. It's a photo journaling app, but there's a lot more to detail into the eating behaviors that would lead to disordered eating. So that one I usually reserve more for my eating disorder clients. What are some of the success stories? Uh, what do people say to you that make it all worth it for you? Uh, I mean, I've got one for you right now. The one client that I've been working with for a couple of months now, one of the things that she started realizing, and you know, after talking with someone so often, sometimes you say things that really clicks and you don't even realize that it clicks. And so I said something to this client and a couple of sessions later, she said, you know what, David, I've started really changing the way I eat and I've really started doing this. And I was like, wow, well, well, tell me what happened. She said, you know, it was something that you said. You said, you know, sometimes we don't slow down enough to be able to listen to, and this is the way she put it, God's voice. I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, you know, God was talking to me, but I was looking for the big answers. I was looking for the miraculous weight loss or the, you know, dress to fit or the the number on the, the scale to change. And she said, I was never listening to those subtle voices. And she said, once I started listening to those subtle voices, I started making changes. Now I'm eating really a lot less. And, and, I, and I said, I never told you to eat less. And she said, no, you didn't. You didn't. In fact, you, you challenged me to eat cookies one time because you wanted me to, to really pay attention to what was going on. 
And so she said, I never really understood that until I started listening to those subtleties. And that was a big difference. So those are those aha light bulb epiphanies that really hit me at my heart. I love it. Yeah. And again, it's the small wins. When you realize that the small wins are the big wins, your whole life changes. Yeah, so much. Oh, now, absolutely. I see that you have a uh, stop smoking cessation. Yeah, it's what is that smoke, about? It's called smoking cessation. So, I became a certified smoking cessation counselor. I love it very much because smoking is just not something that we need to live. So, I find smoking cessation to be easier than I find helping people with their diet and nutrition. How but so? Explain that. Because, again, like I said, you don't need to smoke to live. And so you can literally stop doing that. With food, you can't stop eating. But is there not a physiological component to it for a while? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I tell people that there's three things. There's the addiction to nicotine and it's huge. But I tell people that the addiction to nicotine is a stupid addiction. I'm sorry that I'm using that oh, word. I like it. But the body does, it's really a very simple hook onto a receptor in our brain, and it's not very complicated, but it's very strong. And so what ends up happening is that you do become addicted to nicotine. Nicotine addiction is true. And so what happens is, is that you build then what's called the hook, which is essentially you're dependent on it. And then there is the emotional. So those are the three things that cause people to be uh, essentially stuck with smoking. It's the addiction to nicotine, it's essentially the hook and then, or the behavior, and then it's the emotional component. And by emotion, I also talk about, you know, there's a social component to it too. And, you know, you want to belong to a group of friends and they're smoking or nowadays dueling or vaping. And so you want to do it too, which by the way, let me digress a little bit, dueling and vaping and e-cigarettes. Technically speaking, most people are getting anywhere from two to five times more nicotine in a puff of uh, vaping than they would in an entire cigarette. I didn't know that. So do you think it's easier to quit smoking than to change uh, the way you eat? Or is it a similar etiology, like a similar way to go about it? There are a lot of similarities. There are a lot of similarities. You know, awareness is huge. Mindfulness is huge. Compassion is huge. But abstinence is the key with smoking, whereas with food, it isn't. Yeah. Does journaling help with smoking? A little bit. As long as you are able to incorporate the emotional aspect, yes, then it works very, very well. But it's not the only tool in your arsenal. I do believe for smoking cessation, you do need um, some kind of aid or medication. A lot of people do not do well with cold turkey. Mm -hmm. But then there's also nicotine replacements where we're actually using nicotine to help you wean off nicotine. Right. Otherwise, you're going to be using that cigarette or that vape quite often. How long does it take to break the physiological dependency? So uh, the average smoker quits uh, six to eight times before they finally stop smoking. I tell people they have the three threes. There are three phases. So when you quit smoking, there's the three days. So 72 hours. In those first 72 hours, you get the strongest withdrawals. Then there's the three weeks. And so in three weeks, the amount of nicotine in your body is finally starting to clear out as long as there's no more new nicotine coming back in. And then three months. At about three months, you have pretty much got to a point where as long as there hasn't been any new nicotine, then your body is going to be at a really good place to have the greatest success long-term. Now, with that said... There is a very strong emotional component to this. And so if you've learned how to deal with your emotions with smoking, like people use emotions with food, it's no different, what ends up happening is you're going to go back to cigarettes at, at, at a very stressful or difficult emotional state in your life. So you got to go back to what is very important, and that is learning how to work with your emotions. You got you you to learn your emotions. do the emotional work. You yep, have to you, do it. You have to. The 333 formula mm -hmm. applies to so many aspects of life. Any change you want to make in your life, that's what you got to do. Sure. It's the same thing with food and the work that I do with clients. Sometimes, you know, it's going to take you three days just to kind of figure it out. 
And then it's going to take you about three weeks to go, oh, that's what this is. And you discover a whole bunch of new things. And then by the time you get to three months, it's now become almost habitual. It's a new habit. Yes. And it applies to skills as well. You are just creating a new habit. Right, right. I want to touch on one last thing. You uh, told me you, you deal with a lot of men's health. Yes, I do. Tell me about the man's psyche with food and what you do. Yeah, a really good question. So I think the biggest difference with the man psyche versus the woman is that men don't really understand their emotions or aren't willing to understand that they have emotions. And so oftentimes men are raised with suppressing their emotions significantly. And so what that then does is it doesn't allow them to pay attention to what they are emotionally doing with some of the food that they eat. They don't realize that there is a a strong emotional connection with food. And so that's by far the biggest difference, especially with older generation men that, you know, have a militant approach. They have this bro science. They have this got to get it done. No pain, no gain. If it's not bleeding, don't fix it. If it's not broken, don't fix it. They have this very black and white mentality of how to do things. And there's just too many nuances to all of that. I'm so glad you said that. It's true. And I Mm -hmm. think it's important. And it is not to feminize men. It's actually to make them more masculine, to be a better partner, to be a better provider, to be a better source of strength to everyone they encounter. That was huge, David. I loved that you said that. Yeah, thanks. I um I will say I'm in a female dominated profession. I have five sisters. I grew up I often say with six mothers. And um I enjoy cooking and I stay at home. My wife actually has a, a bigger career than I do and she works in the office. You know, so the traditions are completely reversed. And so it doesn't make me less of a man. It only makes me a better man. A more well-rounded man. Yeah. Agree. And as a woman, I would like to tell all you gentlemen out there, have some emotions, figure it out, because if something's holding you back, it's an emotional blockage. Yep. (laughs) Do the emotional work, get through it, be the man that you are. Yeah, yeah. Toughing it out is not a way to work through your emotions. No, and it makes your life harder. Yes, yes. It might have worked a couple of times, but mm, doesn't work long term. Where can we find you, David? I can be found at tdwellness.com. That's my website. And you can go to my podcast from there, which is onesmallbite.net, but you can just find the link through tdwellness.com. And on social media, I'm at tdwellness almost everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. What kind of podcast shows do you do? I do solo and uh, interviews as well, but I also have a Friday food hack edition, and that's where I do 15 or 20 minutes of giving people lists and how-tos real quick. A lot of people love that because they love, okay, just tell me how to do this. So they love those, those Friday food hacks. Do you do any client work online or is it all in person? All online right now because of COVID. It is I've been able to pivot 100% all online, and a lot of insurance covers our services. So pretty much everything could be done online, and I also offer groups and programs as well. So you can find someone as compassionate and knowledgeable and encouraging as David. You don't have to uh, live where he is. You can do it That's from right. anywhere in the world. I will have all those links in my show notes. Thank as you. Well. Thank you. And thanks for being so, that's that. I love that comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, so very much for being on the show. I really enjoyed this talk. I completely agree with your philosophy. I love that you're a male voice in this area. You can reach a, a section of the population that I think is largely ignored. Thank you so much for everything you do. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for letting me be on your show. And I've had a really good time. This is great. You had really good questions. Thanks, David. Thank you. See ya. This is a fascinating topic and one that I really resonated with as our conversation got more in depth. At first, it may be uncomfortable and difficult to look at food and the way you eat in this manner. 
But if you've been operating in a restrictive and judgmental way in order to lose weight or change your eating habits, this may be a more successful and definitely more gentle method. If you're intrigued, I really recommend you check out the One Small Bite podcast and reach out to David Orozco. As you could tell from this interview, he is very compassionate and passionate about helping people gain a new understanding and perspective in this area. You can find all the links and contact information for him and TD Wellness at howtolife.com slash 031. There's another episode I did that discusses some of the concepts David mentioned that you might find helpful, and it'll reinforce what you learned in this interview. Check out episode 21, The Out of the Box Guide to Fitness with Andrew Takata. That episode, as well as all the others, can be found on my website, howtolife.com. As always, thank you so much for tuning into this show and for all the support you have shown me. The five-star ratings, the reviews, the emails, the YouTube comments, the likes, the shares. I am so grateful for the positive feedback, and I love putting out this content for you. I'm wishing you a beautiful rest of your day, and may those good vibes carry into the rest of the week. Have compassion for yourself. Give yourself a break. You are awesome. All is well. It really is. You got this.